do you see what you can't see? I want to talk to you about something that goes under the radar at places like TED and in general in the technology industry, which is that no matter how incredible our technology gets or the new things coming down the pipe, blockchain, artificial intelligence, medicine, there's something that's not changing, which is something that I've spent the last few years of my life studying, and that's the invisible blind spots or invariant parts of how our mind works. So I learned to think this way when I was a magician as a kid. Uh, this is my mother's birthday party. And I was fascinated because magic teaches you about these consistent blind spots, these things that all minds don't see. Right? It's, it's, it, you could be a quantum physicist, it doesn't matter what age you are, it doesn't matter what language you speak. You could even be a psychologist and study the mind every day and you still wouldn't see how a magic trick works, which is fascinating, right? Because it's not about what our mind knows, it's about how our mind works. And there's blind spots, consistent ways that our mind doesn't see what it doesn't see. And that's why the whole conversation is in our blind spot and I wanted to talk about it. Let me give you uh, an example. Uh, first, if I tell you don't think of an elephant, and just tell yourself don't think of an elephant, immediately your mind sort of automatically thinks of an elephant, right? And that's one of the features of this sort of automatic processing. So it turns out there was a study done that 70% of Facebook users actually only read the headline of science stories before commenting. But the funny, even funnier thing about this story is that the actual remainder of this story was filled with Latin nonsense. <laughs> and, it was temp and it was a test to see how many people would share it. And it was shared f by 50,000 people and generated a firestorm of comments sort of a joke on the whole thing, except the thing is that this is actually our daily internet life. Six out of ten links on the internet are shared without ever having been clicked. In other words, people are more likely to have shared an article than to have read it. <laughs> so we're, we're basically spreading our blind spots all around and having uh, these things spread. And now it might seem small, but if you actually bubble it all the way up to the top of Facebook, about a month ago, Facebook hi uh, fired its entire human editorial news team. There used to be a team of people working at Facebook who checked the headlines and said, uh, you know, is there anything inappropriate that we should monitor? And they fired that team and they let an algorithm run what should be seen. And what they found was that the algorithm saw things just like we do, that the more people share something means it's at the top. And the number one story that day was uh, a totally fabricated story that had no bearing in reality and if you think about this for a second, the number one news source for 40% of the American population in an election year is Facebook. So do we want things that just see things by how we share them, what gets shared the most, to be the way we see our world? Uh, or make a concrete example, in medicine, we have more medical technology and surgery and uh, knowledge than we've ever had before. And at the same time, human errors still persist. In fact, about 25% of hospitalized patients will be further harmed by just totally accidental human errors. If you go in for surgery, there's 40 surgeries every single week in the United States where someone walks out with surgery on the wrong part of their body, all due by simple human mental accidents, the things we don't see that we don't see. If we called it a disease, it would be the number three leading cause of deaths uh, in the United States behind heart disease and cancer. So this is totally in our blind spot. If you had another public issue of concern, and let's say you were a business and you didn't want people to know about it, what would you do if there's some big public issue? Well, one strategy you can use, almost like a magician would think, is you can cast doubt about an issue. And you can say, well, the science isn't really clear, the jury's still out, it's controversial, we don't really know yet. Right? This is a strategy, and in fact, this is the exact strategy that the, the tobacco company used, uh, saying that doubt is our product, since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. So these things work, and they're not changing, and that's why I wanted to talk about it today. Because while all of this other stuff gets better, the human condition stays the same. And no amount of technology can, can, can hide that. So uh, one of my favorite media theorists is Neil Postman, and he wrote this, uh, in the 1980s, there is no escaping from ourselves. The human dilemma is as it has always been, and we solve nothing fundamental by cloaking ourselves in technological glory. Now, I am a technologist. I actually believe a lot in the power of technology, but the reason I wanted to talk about this topic 
is because if we strap technology onto our blind spots, then we end up with the kinds of things that we're seeing here. And so I wanted to talk about uh, two reasons why this matters now. So if we've always had blind spots, we've always had them, they're part of our nature, why should we care about them now, right? We've always had marketing and advertising, we've always had these tactics. Well, the two reasons are that the consequences are getting bigger, right? Big issues in society are actually stopped by our inability to call out these kinds of tactics as they're being used. And the second issue is that it's as if we're plugging our technology, we're plugging our blind spots into the amplifier that is our technology. So we're spreading our blind spots around and we can't see what we can't see at a massive scale. So I think that this signals a kind of new period of human development and human history in the sense that if we have human beings growing up from this whole lineage and we had the enlightenment in which we put all new authority in daring to know, we essentially put authority in the power of the human mind. We said individuals, the power of the individual to choose their life, to make choices, to use reason. And that got us really far. I don't want to discount that. That's an amazing thing. But what we're coming up against is essentially the limits of reason itself. We're coming up against the limits of our own instrument, of our own mind. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is why we need to dare to know ourselves. And not just that we're bigger and better and we stand taller, but we actually look back at what we are and see ourselves honestly for the little tiny mistakes and quirks that we, that we have. And I think this involves also having a new identity as a person. Almost like, you know, I became sort of a vegetarian recently in that moment when you think of yourself as a vegetarian, you actually think of yourself in a different way. I think we need to think of ourselves as being built into, as built into our nature is that there are things that we don't see that we're not seeing. Now, what would that do? Well, today we have this blind spot based world and imagine if instead of that, beyond that, we focused on creating an anti-blind world. I don't mean anti-blind like against, I mean anti-blind by putting blind spots at the center of how we design all of our institutions, by putting blind spots at the center of what we want our world to look like and acknowledging our true nature. And not just in a negative way, but actually to help us see all the things that we can't see. So what would that look like? Well, one of my favorite um, metaphors for this is actually a blind spot mirror in a car. You know, when we have these things, we acknowledge that there's something we don't see that we don't see. And we put it right there. And it requires not just this, but also that the person knows this, right? We all accept that there's just things we don't see that we don't see. But imagine we could instrument our whole environment to do this for ourselves everywhere. And it would be an empowering thing. A good example of this in medicine is in Atul Gawande's book, The Checklist Manifesto, where he said, he basically demonstrated that by introducing a quick safety checklist before, during, and after surgeries, you can, simply, you can reduce uh, these kinds of medical accidents uh, in huge dramatic ways. Just having doctors voice their names to each other before a surgery reduces uh, death and complications by 35% because it, it, it quiets invisible power dynamics and makes it safer for people to talk to each other. So just these tiny changes. But imagine this is anti-blind medicine. Imagine anti-blind, uh, an anti-blind internet that saw that there was more to people than just what they clicked on. That we actually desire more than simply the feedback loop of what we click on. Imagine anti-blind media that acknowledged that people are persuadable and they called out persuasive tactics as they were being used. Imagine anti-blind organizations that, that knew about the the narrowing qualities of groupthink and the blind spots that groupthink creates and created practices and strategies to diversify thinking to create counter teams, red teams that help the regular group see more of what they're not seeing. This is used by many different successful uh, companies. And anti-blind science that dealt with the issues of um, uh, null submits and, um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, sometimes this is also not easy. Uh, I'm not saying this is easy, by the way. Uh, in fact, for me personally, I have a, a story in which this was highly uncomfortable. So when I was 24, living here in San Francisco, I was CEO of a startup company that 
uh, I really deeply, deeply believed in. And I was so good at convincing people, whether they were investors or my employees or uh, you know, anyone, about the ideas and selling my ideas to them that I didn't see how I was selling the ideas to myself. And when you're running a company, there's a lot of pressure, obviously, to sort of know what you're doing and to be certain about what you're doing. And there's never a safe place to go about your doubts about what you're doing or to even question your own thinking. And I think this was highly, highly important, and I, I had a kind of a hunger for it and talked to some friends, and it turned out they had it too. So we started something called Doubt Club. And Doubt Club was basically a support group where we just met, highly confidential, to talk about our doubts about our companies, our products, our missions, and our lives. And it led to really profound changes and directions in our lives for all of us, including, frankly, the reason I'm probably here on stage today is because of Doubt Club. Uh, and it really think, I really think that it helped instrument a, a different way of seeing myself. I mean, I started to see myself as someone, it took, it took me seeing myself as someone who didn't see the whole picture, right? It helped me realize that there's always more to be seen than what I'm seeing. And you can imagine if a whole society did that. Imagine if a whole society realized that we can lean on each other to help us see more of what we're not seeing and that there's always more to see. We've changed our collective identity before in subtle ways. But one example that I like is when this picture was taken in 1968 when the Apollo moon mission turned around from the moon and it took this picture of Earth. And the astronauts who experienced this had a profound, intimate, felt experience, which they later called the overview effect. There is something about seeing the Earth as this thing that you're obviously, it's not like the Earth was new, but when you're on it, you see it as this big, indestructible thing. And when you're on the moon, you see just how incredible it is that we're even here right now. And you see how vulnerable and sacred, maybe there might be something worth protecting. But they had to look back on it. And this photo was partially credited with helping to galvanize the environmental movement, and the Environmental Protection Agency was started two years later. And it helped create a whole new consciousness, a whole new way of seeing ourselves. Um, now, what I kind of would like to argue is what if we had something like that for ourselves and our own humanity? What if we'd be willing to look back at our own humanity and the sort of sacredness of our mind. Maybe there's something to protect, like an environmental movement for our mind that we might want to uh, hold sacred and protect. And what would that look like? You know, I don't have all the answers. I've been thinking about this for a little while, but I think it's one of the most important conversations that we're collectively not talking about by definition because it's in our blind spot. But if you think about it, we're one of the rare species who could ever even do this, right? We don't know of any other animal living that can introspect enough to see the limits of its own thinking. And if there are existential threats that we face right now, uh, this is a rare opportunity for us to actually meet them. I think we can, and I hope you'll join me. Thank you. Thank you.